Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurophysician from Rajmanri, Andhra Pradesh, India. My email is 3klpm at gmail.com. I am also the medical author of the two books Focus Neurology and Exam Oriented Clinical Neurology. We are continuing with the neuroimaging concepts and from today we will kick start with spinal cord disorders. So neuroimaging concepts part 33 spinal cord disorders part 1 introduction. Diseases of the spinal cord are frequently devastating. They produce quadriplegia, paraplegia and sensory deficits far beyond the damage they would inflict elsewhere in the nervous system because the spinal cord contains in a small cross-sectional area almost the entire motor output and sensory input of the trunk and limbs. So diseases of the spinal cord are frequently devastating. So this is the transverse section through the spinal cord. We can see the motor descending tracks and the sensory ascending tracts and this is the axial section showing the herniated disc. So this is the spinal cord. So centrally we have the grey matter. So we have the motor neurons anterior horncils. This is the grey matter and peripherally we have the white matter. So here the most important tracts are the posterior column amongst the sensory tracts. So they lie posteriorly. They are responsible for joint position and vibration sense. So this is the posterior column, fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis and they are responsible for joint position vibration sense. And the next important tract is the lateral spinothalamic tract. They are responsible for pain and temperature and we also have ventral spinothalamic tract which has got a minor role in touch. So the most important tract is the lateral spinothalamic tract. Here what happens is that it is an ascending tract. So it is primarily responsible for pain and temperature. So as the fibers ascend, the sacral fibers cross over and then ascend. Then the thoracic fibers cross over and then ascend and then the cervical fibers cross over and then ascend. So as they keep ascending, what happens? So as they cross over and come, the spinothalamic tract, the sacral fibers are the lateral most, followed by the lumbar, followed by the thoracic and followed by cervical. This is very very important because if there is an extra medullary lesion that is outside the spinal cord coming and compressing the spinal cord, the sacral fibers are the first to get affected followed by lumbar, followed by thoracic, followed by cervical. So it produces an ascending type of uh, sensory disturbance. Whereas if it is an intramedullary lesion that is coming from the inside the spinal cord and going outside, the cervical fibers will get hit first, followed by thoracic, followed by lumbar and finally the sacral fibers. So if it's, if it's an intramedullary lesion, the sacral fibers may not be affected because it is the lateral most part and it results in a classic sensory sparing or sorry sacral sparing. If it is an extra medullary lesion, the sacral fibers are the first to get compressed followed by lumbar, thoracic and cervical. It is an ascending type of sensory disturbance whereas if it is an intra lesion, the cervical, thoracic and lumbar sacral gets affected. So it is a descending type of sensory disturbance. So these are the two important tracks. One is the posterior column which is placed posteriorly and responds for joint position vibration sense and the lateral spinothalamic tract which is responsible for pain and temperature. And then we have other tracks also. Uh, one is the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and then the ventral spinocerebellar tract. And from the grey matter as it comes outside we have the dorsal root and these are the anterior horncils from here it comes the ventral root. So here comes the dorsal root and then it goes to the dorsal root ganglia and here it is the anterior horncil and comes as the ventral root. So the grey matter is hedge shaped and is placed centrally and then we have the periphery placed white matter. So this is about the sensory and when it comes to the motor as I said the grey horn, the anterior horncils are present in the grey matter. So this is the anterior horncils 
and a very important tract we have is the lateral corticospinal tract or pyramidal tract. So it is primarily responsible for distal limb movements. So any person who is suffering from hemiplegia where the corticospinal tract gets affected, the distal limb movements get affected more than the proximal limb movements because the lateral corticospinal tract is primarily the pyramidal tract which is, is primarily responsible for distal limb movements. But for axial and proximal limb movements, we have the vestibulospinal tract, the ventral reticulospinal tract and the tectospinal tract so which are responsible for the axial and proximal limb movements whereas the corticospinal tract the lateral corticospinal tract is primarily responsible for distal limb movements uh, and then we have these other tracts which are responsible for axial and proximal limb movements that is lateral reticulospinal tract vestibulospinal tract ventral reticulospinal tract and tectospinal tract so the lateral corticospinal tract and rubrospinal tract are primary response for distal limb movements and therefore in persons who are suffering from hemiplegia due to corticospinal tract lesions primarily basically the distal limb movements get affected more than the proximal limb movements and uh, they are very devastating so the physiotherapy part also we concentrate more on the distal limb movements because they get affected more and we have a uh, ventral uncrossed corticospinal tract which has got a very minor role in the distal movement movements. So the distal limb movements, uh, basically it is supplied by the lateral corticospinal tract. So this is the transverse section through the spinal cord. And one of the important disorders we see, especially backache, neck pain, what we see is the herniated disc. So this is the disc and this is the spinal cord. We have the gray matter here and we have the peripherally placed white matter as i said from the anterior horn cell we get the motor root and from the and from the dorsal side we get the dorsal root ganglia dorsal root going to the dorsal root ganglia so this is the dorsal root and this is the ventral root so generally the disc is is in its placed so it will be only placed in this particular area so but due to degeneration or excessive activity the disc may get prolapsed especially the posterior laterally so we call one of the common uh, sites of the disc prolapse is the posterior lateral so posterior lateral when it prolapses in a posterior lateral fashion the dorsal root gets affected so patients will have severe radicular type of pain so and we see the herniated disc usually in the cervical area and the sacral area we don't see much in the thoracic area why because of two reasons neck we keep moving here this way that way so there's excessive movement at the neck and excessive movement at the lumbosacral area because of this excessive movements there's a degeneration there's a degeneration of the disc and herniation and the second important point is that thoracic disc prolapse is not that common because one there is no excessive movement at the thorax second the thorax is protected by the rib cage and therefore we see disc prolapse commonly in the cervical area and lumbosacral area so posterior lateral disc is very common and it usually produces it compresses the dorsal root and they have severe radicular type of pain this is not much dangerous but if it is a central disc it will go and compress the spinal cord and can result in a myelopathy that is dangerous whereas posterior lateral disc prolapse will usually affect the root so it produces only root pain so that is not much dangerous but they'll have severe pain whereas central disc prolapse can compress the spinal cord and produce uh, myelopathy So, as I said earlier, we have the spinal cord, we have extramedullary compression coming from outside the spinal cord and compressing, we have an intramedullary lesion inside the spinal cord expanding out. So, what are all the differences between an extramedullary lesion and intramedullary lesion? When we take pain in extramedullary lesion, it's an early symptom. You can see the root coming out, so it will go and compress the root and they will have pain. Whereas in intramedullary lesion, the pain is poorly localized or burning or deep. When it comes to the sensory, as I said, the spinothalamic tract 
ascends and then crosses over and then goes to the other side and therefore when there is an extramedullary compression the spinothalamic tract is affected but the symptoms are produced on the opposite side pain and temperature loss because the spinothalamic tract crosses immediately and ascends one or two segments and then ascends whereas the posterior column and corticospinal tract cross at the level of the medulla oblongata but spinothalamic tract within one or two segment it crosses and therefore the symptoms of pain and temperature are seen on the contralateral side whereas in intramedullary lesion when it is inside the spinal cord the, since the spinothalamic tract crosses and then goes the spinothalamic tract gets affected if it's an intramedullary lesion whereas posterior column and pyramidal tract which are laterally placed and which cross at the level of the medulla oblongata they are not affected so very interesting phenomenon is that spinothalamic tract is affected in an intramedial lesion sparing the posterior column so there is a dissociated sensory loss the pain and temperature carried by the spinothalamic tract is affected but the sensations that is that touch position joint vibration sense carried by posterior column is spared so this is known as dissociated sensory loss association means coming together dissociation means going away and therefore one of the important features is dissociated sensory loss wherein pain and temperature carried by the spinothalamic tract is affected but vibration proprioception spared by uh, carried by posterior column is spared because they don't traverse to the spinal cord uh, to the gray matter they go peripherally and then cross at the level of the medulla oblongata and second important uh, uh, point about sensitive set is that in an extra medial lesion uh, the posterior column is the sensations carried by posterior column by proprioception are affected ipsilaterally on the same set because it has already crossed at the level of the medulla oblongata and therefore the findings are on the same set <coughs> uh, whereas in an intra medial lesion as i said the spinothalamic tract fibers as they cross over the sacral fibers are laterally placed and therefore there is sacral sparing the cervical thoracic lumbar followed by sacral gets affected so sacral is the last to get affected or it may be spared also and as i said again it's an ascending type of sensory loss of it's an extra medial lesion the sacral fibers are the first to get compressed followed by lumbar thoracic and cervical so it's an ascending type of sensory deficits when it comes to the motor deficits in an extra medial lesion since a pyramidal tract is placed laterally they get affected so prominent umn signs and the legs get affected early because the leg fibers are placed laterally and then they can have ataxia also because the spinocerebellar fibers which are also placed peripherally they get affected and therefore they can have prominent umn signs legs get affected followed by ataxia whereas here it's an intramedial lesion that means it is in the gray matter so we have the anterior horn cells in the gray matter so in the anterior horn cells in the gray matter get affected it results in atrophy and fasciculations uh, fasciculations is because of canon's law of denervation supersensitivity so when anterior horn cells get affected they'll have fasciculations so these are all the important differences between the extramedial lesion and intramedial lesion in an extramedial lesion pain is an early symptom whereas in internal intramedial lesion poorly localized burning deep pain when it comes to sensory deficits in an extra medial lesion the spinothalamic tract the sensations are affected on the opposite side so contralateral pain and temperature loss ipsilateral posterior column that is vibration posterior sensory loss and ascending type of sensory deficit because sacral lumbar thoracic and cervical when it comes to an intra medial lesion the spinothalamic tract gets affected so pain and temperature are lost but sensations carried by posterior column vibration proprioception are spared and it's a descending type of sensory loss when it comes to the motor deficits the peripherally placed corticospinal tracts and spinocerebellar tracts get affected so they have prominent uh, umn signs leg fibers are placed laterally so they get affected first and then ataxia whereas in intramedial lesions anterior horn cells get affected so they'll have bilateral lmn bilateral lmn signs atrophy and fasciculations so these are all the important uh, differences yeah myelopathies how do we uh, divide we divide it into acute chronic and mixed acute means within few days of uh, the lesion they start presenting with symptoms chronic means it can go on for weeks and months sometimes it can be a mixed type so what are all the myelopathies which present in an acute fashion one immune mediated second infectious third vascular these present acutely immune mediated infectious and vascular the spinal cord disorders which present in a chronic fashion are neoplastic 
toxic or metabolic or hereditary neoplastic toxic metabolic like vitamin b12 deficiency or hereditary and sometimes it could be mixed structural so myelopathies can be can be acute chronic and mixed type so this is an overview of spinal cord disorders and introduction to spinal cord disorders uh, the other important clinical neurology points i put in an, a book called an exam oriented clinical neurology all important clinical neurology points are covered in this book so if interested this book could be purchased it will be especially useful for students preparing for clinical neurology exams the other book i've written is focused neurology and the author dr srinivas published by cbs publishers and distributors all the theoretical points of neurology i put it in a question answer format so it will be useful for students especially preparing for oral or viva exams this book is available online from all leading booksellers including amazon so if interested this book could be purchased online i hope you have enjoyed listening to these wonderful concepts of spinal cord disorders and introduction overview if you have enjoyed please like and share and subscribe to my youtube channel uh, dr srinivas medical concept which is india's leading neurology educational youtube channel and also my fb page dr srinivas concepts thank you bye